Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a panel discussion with Dan Fallon and Noah Ditto, Cartera's technical product manager. During the webinar, please send your questions by private chat to me, John McKinley, the host. Cartera's new nickel biosensor chip is available for shipment. The antibody discovery industry has been making great strides in the fight against COVID-19. For example, Abcellera and Eli Lilly developed a therapeutic antibody for the potential treatment of COVID-19 in record speed, taking less than three months to advance from initial screen to human clinical trials, which is amazing. And the Cartera LSA provided the kinetic and epitope analysis for these studies. Today, we're privileged to have Dan Fallon, Senior Research Associate at Dragonfly Therapeutics, present on their advances in antibody discovery for bispecific therapeutics. Dan has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in microbiology from UMass Amherst. Dan has been working at Dragonfly Therapeutics for three years and is focused on the characterization of biologics. Dan, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Today, I'll be discussing how we implement uh, Cartera's LSA system at Dragonfly. Uh, for antibody development and discovery um, for a bi-specific platform. So at Dragonfly, uh, our technology revolves around the natural killer cell. And so we aim to harness the broad anti-tumor activity of natural killer cells and redirect it against tumor cells. And natural killer cells are uh, uniquely well positioned to uh, attack tumor cells because they require a very uh, specific signal uh, of both activating receptors and a lack of inhibitory signals. And um, they bridge the innate and the adaptive immune system together quite nicely. So upon uh, a certain uh, combination of uh, receptors being ligated on the NK cell and uh, missing inhibitory signals, uh, this NK cell packed with granules uh, of these uh, perforins and granzymes will directly kill tumor cells um, by releasing them into the lytic synapse and uh, causing apoptosis of the cancer cells, but uh, can also secrete these chemokines and cytokines, which are really important for ramping up the immune system and the immune response. And so these uh, chemokines can recruit other cells of the innate immune system, specifically dendritic cells. And then these dendritic cells um, will be activated and then can go on and uh, recruit and activate cytotoxic T cells. And these uh, cytotoxic T cells can then go and directly kill the cancer cell as well. And so by uh, approaching uh, this response with the NK cell, we get a very robust and a, a very specific early uh, immune response against the tumor cell, which gives us a, a very nice therapeutic window. And so Dragonfly's approach is to use a bispecific antibody that essentially bridges the NK cell uh, to the tumor cell. And so one arm of the bispecific will bind the uh, tumor antigen with high affinity. And then um, the other arm will uh, signal uh, a receptor on the NK cell uh, to tell it um, to you know, release these apoptotic proteins and to, to uh, ramp up this uh, overall immune response. And so through this um, bispecific platform, we aim to stimulate new mechanisms for both direct and indirect tumor killing. Uh, we know that the uh, the platform, what we call uh, trinkets, work powerfully as single agents. We've seen that um, both in uh, a number of models in vitro and in vivo, but also can be uh, powerfully augmented when combined with uh, T cell based therapies. And since these NK cells require such a uh, specific uh, orchestra of activating and inhibitory signals, uh, it does a very, very uh, good job of discerning healthy and, uh, and cancerous cells. And so Usually with such a robust immune response, you'll get some uh, nonspecific killing of uh, healthy cells, but uh, the, the NK cells are uh, uniquely good at uh, uh, singling out these, these infected cells. And so this is a schematic of a traditional bispecific antibody. And so we have this anti-NK cell arm pretty well established. And then uh, as part of our uh, discovery campaigns, we look for uh, indications that we think may uh, respond well to this early NK cell driven immune response. And that may, that uh, the population may be lacking a, uh, a good therapeutic. 
And so uh, we've been using the LSA to discover uh, a number of new anti uh, tumor associated antigen arms for our bi specific platform. And so this is um, kind of a typical criteria we would look for uh, in our antibody discovery pipeline. We usually want it to be, uh, or we always want it to be high affinity for the uh, tumor antigen, uh, usually single digit nanomolar or, or picomolar affinity for a monovalent interaction or an off rate that is uh, slower than five times 10 to the minus four. Um, we usually are looking for syno cross reactivity if we think we can get it. We want high affinity binding to uh, cell express receptors, both human and syno. Uh, we want no cross reactivity with the related family members. So we want this uh, antibody to be highly specific for, uh, for the uh, TAA. We want broad epitope coverage in our discovery campaign so we can understand um, how targeting different epitopes can um, strengthen or weaken the uh, overall response. We want a clean PSR profile and a clean HIC profile. So we want it to be highly specific again um, for that TAA, and we want there to be a, a very limited number of uh, surface exposed hydrophobic patches. So we want it to be highly manufacturable. We want it to be uh, very thermal stable. So a melting temp of the fab to be greater than 65 Celsius. And then we want uh, no potential sequence liabilities in the CDR. So no, um, you know, glycosylation motifs or oxidation, deamidation, isomerization motifs. Um, so we, we can manufacture it in a very reproducible manner. And so uh, today I'll be talking about a discovery campaign uh, for a target that I will uh, call uh, human TAA1 and uh, some of the challenges we faced and how we implemented the LSA to address those challenges. So this is a, a cartoon representation of TA1, um, but this is this is actually kind of what it looks like. And this, these are real challenges associated with uh, discovering antibodies against it. And so human TA1 has low sequence homology with Sino TA1, so that uh, is an obvious challenge for getting cross reactivity for Sino models. TA1 is heavily glycosylated, and uh, TA1 belongs to a wide family of highly homologous proteins. So uh, there's what I, what I call TA2, three, and four. Uh, look quite similar. There's a number of similar domains that are found in TA1, and we want the um, we want the antibody to only bind to unique uh, regions within TA1. And so this is a pretty um, pretty specific profile we're looking for. And in these discovery campaigns, we can get dozens to hundreds of antibodies. And so it's critical that we can get uh, a really robust characterization of these antibodies early on in the screening funnel. So we don't uh, start advancing one that may be cross reactive with one of these family members, or um, you know it, it can't discern differentially glycosylated uh, TA one. So um, we we need a really high throughput instrument to to um, you know achieve these goals, and that's where Cartera's LSA came in quite nicely. Um, it was able to achieve uh, you know screening uh, hundreds of antibodies at once. Uh, whereas the 8K really wasn't built for, for that early on in the screening funnel. And so uh, Cartera assists on the LSA can look at up to 384 interactions per experiment. Uh, it can, correct, can capture directly from hybridoma soup. Uh, it requires low antigen, even for these really high throughput experiments. And the experiments can be done in the same day. You can set up, run, and, and analyze really in the same day. And these are some of the core applications that the LSA offers. The traditional kinetics affinity, epitope binning, mapping, and quantitation, and below are just some representative uh, output from the from these applications. Uh, these are uh, non-regenerative kinetic sensorgrams, a uh, heat map from a binning experiment, a crossing experiment, uh, a network map. I'm not very familiar with the the mapping functionality. You can also do um, some uh, tighter analysis and quantitation, but for dragonflies purposes, we primarily relied on it for kinetic and affinity screening, uh, as well as epitope binning. Um, but in the near future, we're going to start looking at uh, the tighter analysis functionality of the instrument. And so the LSA is able to achieve this massive throughput uh, in large part due to its uh, 96 spot uh, print head. It's this, it's this pretty uh, cool uh, component within the, within the instrument that essentially can miniaturize uh, your traditional 96 well plate into uh, through its, its its kind of microfluidic shell in there and and print it onto 
um, you know, a, a traditional carboxymethyldextrin trip, chip or, or whatever they're offering, whatever you seek to capture on. And it can do this um, four separate times. So, you know, the, here is 196 uh, spot capture. It can stagger it four separate times for 384 captures. And, um, you know, in a traditional unidirectional flow SPR instrument, uh, it doesn't use the space nearly as efficiently, uh, nor does it use the uh, capture molecule uh, as efficiently. So, you know, a, a regular capture requires, I think, like maybe 250 or 300 microliters of um, solution per spot, but then we'll return, I think, you know, over 90% of it back to back to the plate. So you're really only consuming uh, you know, 20 or 30 microliters per experiment. And so we, we primarily used the, the instrument for uh, hybridoma screening. And so, you know, we don't always have 384 antibodies to capture, but um, we, we typically have a few dozen, if not, you know, up to 100. And these tight these these hybridomas have really wide tighter variability. And prior to the LSA, you know, trying to trying to adjust this on the vehicle was just super laborious. And you know, one one hybridoma might be one microgram per mil, another one might be 50 microgram per mil, and then these hybridomas are polyclonal. And so, you know, your capture level isn't always um, representative of what you'll you can expect for an R max. And so it's it's a very imperfect um, kind of development on on like our via core system, and the LSA gets around this really nicely just through just sheer number. And so what it can do is, say you have ninety six antibodies, you can print at four different capture densities in one experiment. So rather than you know sitting at the instrument and and capturing you know a you know, few densities and then trying to implement that into your experiment. You can combine that uh, the assay optimization and the actual run into uh, into your experiment, and so that saves us a, a ton of time. Similarly, it can use the um, the single flow cell um, to dock onto the uh, printed surface, and uses again very minimal protein. So, if you were to probe one antibody versus a full three hundred eighty four array. You use the same amount of analyte just based on how the single flow cell works, and so for an experiment on the LSA, the um, if you were to do two full dilutions and, and run a full kinetic experiment, you really only need 600 microliters of your uh, top concentration, and then you can just do a, a two full dilution throw because it only needs uh, a 300 microliter slug of analyte to uh, to get uh, full kinetics across the surface. Whereas if we were doing our via core, I mean, time aside that running on the via core would be does, you know, 10 different experiments to due to plate uh, limitations and, and, uh, you know, what it can actually uh, run in one experiment, but just from the analyte standpoint, you know, based on our, our typical association rate and, and, uh, and our flow rate, um, we would use up to 170 mils. I mean, depending on your settings, it might be hundred mils or 200 mils, but it's on that order. And so just very quickly comparing them, their, their orders of magnitude different. And so, you know, for the, for this specific campaign, this would have been uh, extremely expensive to purchase all the recombinant protein. We would have had to probably bring it in the house and, and try to and express and purify here. But since we have the LSA, uh, we can get around that quite nicely. And since the LSA has been implemented, we've actually had a number of uh, Hybridoma campaigns initiated at Dragonfly uh, six, I believe, since getting it, and it's been a little over a year. And across these six, we've yielded almost a thousand different uh, hybridoma supernatants to be tested. And, and uh, depending on the program, uh, there might be multiple targets. Like uh, this one is actually what I'll, what, what will be TA one. What I'm discussing today, we're looking at human and sino um, binding as well as all these different family members. So you're not just looking for you know 304. Interactions you're really looking for, you know, 1800, and so it, it, it's it you can't get that done on another instrument, and and that's the the area I think the LSA has fit really nicely in for us. And so overall, across these six programs in the past uh, year, we've got to look uh, over 4,000 interactions. And so tying it back to um, our discovery campaign we discussed today. Um, this was one of our most uh, intensive ones, just a number of uh, targets we wanted to probe as well as the, uh, 
the number of soups we got from it. And so we had uh, two different strains of mice. We had our wild type Balp C mice. We, um, we've had a lot, a lot of success in of, of getting antibodies out of, but we also in this one tried uh, transgenic mice, which have a, a rat FC, but uh, fully human variable domains. And so uh, that can nicely accelerate our development pipeline because we wanted to go through uh, a full humanization effort to uh, you know graft it onto a, a human framework and, and try to retain the, the high affinity. And so this, these were performed by our collaborators at Green Mountain Antibodies who always do a really wonderful job. And uh, we came up with a, what we thought was a reasonable immunization strategy of using cell expressed um, protein, recombinant full length protein and uh, truncated versions of the antigen to try to guide the immune response to uh, regions that are specific to TA1 and that uh, may increase our, uh, our uh, likelihood of getting cross reactivity. Uh, and then, you know, the ones from what, from the valve C uh, would have to humanize and if we lose affinity in that process, then we'd have to affinity mature as well, which we do uh, in-house. And then uh, as a second approach, kind of hedge our discovery campaign. We also pursued uh, a, a yeast um, campaign where we uh, took the splenocytes from the uh, transgenic mice with the human variable domains and constructed uh, six immune libraries. And now this is our um, this is our screening funnel for hybridoma soups, and this is a bit specific to uh, TA1, but generally follow a, a similar um, a similar pipeline. And and this is a, a simplified um, pipeline. There's there's usually a number of decisions made and sub steps to each one, but um, overall this is kind of how we we approach it. And so. You have uh, our collaborators, Green Mountain Antibodies. Um, they do all the immunization and, and cell fusions and create the hybridomas, as well as doing the ELISA against uh, the TA1, uh, human, Seno, and then we'll look at cross reactivity against uh, you know, family members two, three, and four. And then they'll ship us down all the hybridomas. And prior to the LSA, we wouldn't be able to really do any meaningful kinetic and affinity and, and specificity screening at this stage. We would have to kind of defer to the cell binding data, but since we've got that in house, we can now run uh, this and the uh, isogenic and cancer cell line binding in parallel. And so we can uh, look to see if our, uh, you know, our SPR uh, binding data, it correlates well with the cell binding data and it, it really uh, speeds up our, you know, our subclone uh, nomination and sequencing selection process. And so, uh, we had, I think the instrument was undergoing a repair at this point. Usually uh, we would find the soups that um, have a reasonable affinity for human TA1. And then we would um, bend those with uh, tool antibodies we have where we know what domain they bind and, and would want to understand what kind of epitope diversity we have from the active soups. But fortunately, we weren't able to use the LSA for this instance. Uh, it, it lends itself quite well to the instrument, but uh, here we use the core. And, and, and looked at what kind of diversity we had uh, from this initial stage. And then based on the cell binding and specificity and affinity and epitope diversity, uh, we'll sit down and, and select subclones, or excuse me, uh, clones for uh, subclone nomination and sequencing. We'll get those back. We'll test, make sure the subclones uh, retain their activity um, and uh, we will get the sequences. And then we will take those uh, anti-TAA sequences and then plug them into our uh, bispecific or, or trinket platform, check uh, what kind of diversity we have among those against each other, as well as uh, see how they can uh, kill in our kind of our, our um, cell killing assays. And then we can look how, um, how the cell killing uh, is correlated with the bin, how it's correlated with the affinity. And uh, it's, a, it's a really pretty complete package. Here is just a, a representative of um, what we would get from one of these preliminary kinetic screens. So very early on in the pipeline, Green Mountain will, will send us down um, X number of uh, antibodies. And, uh, you know, that same day, we can plate it and dilute it and running buffer and then just get it right on the instrument. And then, you know, that evening or the following day, we can, we'll have a, um, a pretty diverse panel and an accurate panel of kinetics and affinities of these soups. And then this is, uh, I think, a nice example of why that um, why that massive capture surface is actually a really, really nice feature because 
you know, um, there are some people who are saying, you know, we, we don't need 384, that, that's overkill, but we found that we can actually really leverage that uh, nicely in that uh, typically if I have like, uh, you know, let's say I have 96 antibodies, I will dilute, I'll dilute them one to three of uh, the soup to running buffer, and then I'll do three full dilutions through there. And so these higher, tighter uh, clones, like let's say clone two here, you know, all our maxes are pretty reasonable. And so, um, you know, all three dilutions work fine, but as you get to these lower, tighter antibodies, like clone three and clone four, you know, the one to 27 isn't, might not be the perfect um, dilution factor for that one. Uh, and then definitely not for clone four because there's, um, there's just really not enough protein on the chip. And, and if that thing was polyclonal and, and you thought you captured something, but then you see no binding, well, then you, you might be out of luck. You might just say, oh yeah, clone four is, is inactive. But in reality, um, you just you simply didn't have enough on the chip. And so we don't have to use these. We can just toss them out and say, here are three uh, good representative sensor grams of these clones. And I just, I picked these three because the, the R maxes were all pretty similar. And so then we can take all that data. We can triage out the ones that have too high of R maxes, ones that are too low. And, uh, you know, if they're pretty similar, we can get some, uh, you know, uh, statistics on them. But, you know, once we look at the panel, we see we have a pretty diverse, um, a pretty diverse group of binders here with, with a fast off rate, slow off rate. Uh, and then when we compare the negative control to our non-binders, they look quite similar. So then treatment does a very good job of, uh, you know, really isolating the uh, interactions at each spot. So we don't see like bleed across, you know, if there was some interaction, if these were, spots were near each other, um, you know, it, it, it isolates them quite well. And so the ones that don't bind look just like our negative control. A really nice feature of the uh, kinetic analysis software is this ISO affinity plot. And so if you want to understand your kinetic diversity of the library you get back, it's very easy to look at your affinity diversity. You can just sort, but um, this is a, a nice visual representation of, um, of, of what binders you have. So it'll, they plot the on rate by the off rate and, and the affinities are dropped across the uh, plot and then you can go ahead and gate them. And so I gated this uh, white region here with a off rate that's slower than one uh, times 10 to the minus four and affinity that's tighter than 10 nanomolar. And so uh, we can go in here and say, you know, these are probably clones we're pretty interested in. Uh, and then there's these kind of two sub gates where one is uh, the low of the high affinity, but the off rate might be a little bit faster. So it, probably ones we don't want to throw up, but we want to take a closer look at it, see what the on rate looks like and, and the overall fit. Uh, similarly, these ones have a slow off rate, but a, uh, a uh, weaker affinity. So it'll be double digit plus uh, nanomolar. And so again, uh, we can very easily kind of triage this data. And uh, Another nice feature is that you can you can go ahead and just hover over each one. Something I'm hovering over this one or, or one of these over here, and the sensor gram will pop up with the uh, kinetics and affinity. And so you can make calls to make sure, like, you know, you you click you click this clone, um, but uh, maybe it's a bad fit. But you can you can very easily investigate that. So that was the kinetic and affinity screening for the target, but we also want to look at the other targets, uh, the other family members. So. Here's a cartoon representation of TA1, and then TA2, 3, and 4 are all kind of just subdomains of this with slightly different glycosylation. And so, you know, pre LSA, we wouldn't, we just wouldn't have the throughput to look at 304 antibodies against each one of these. We would just have to defer to cell binding if they were able to gather all that data, or just wait until the further in the pipeline where we could reasonably uh, actually check these on the via core and, and usually we'd want to do that with a like purified antibody or something but the lsa does a nice job you just can do a, a one shot um concentration i think I did one micromolar here you can do a few it's a pretty quick experiment and you can very quickly look at binders versus non-binders uh and then and then throw them out we can look at clone 43 is has a high uh affinity for ta2 same thing for clone 19. those may be ones that we're not interested in and, and can very quickly be triaged out and these experiments themselves are, are very quick. So, you know, if you were to do capture and run this binding experiment, it might take you like all of two or three hours. So you could do, you know, almost a full characterization of these three uh, family members in a matter of a day to two days. And so once we have characterized all the hybridoma supernatants, 
we will uh, combine our SPR data with our cell binding data, as well as the uh, epitope um, tool map binning. We're not shown here, but um, it, it's another consideration. Uh, we'll, we'll look to see that they are in agreement um, because we, we, we want to make sure you know we're not advancing uh, ones that look like they're high affinity to the recombinant protein, but then show no pro excuse me no binding to uh, cell expressed. And so um, that's another another checkbox we have to go through. And uh, the LSA will actually you know improve our confidence in our recombinant proteins because we can check like a hundred antibodies. And for the most part, for, at least for this program, our recombinant proteins match uh, quite nicely with the cell expressed. And so. We see a nice, we see nice binding to human TA1. We see a nice shift in the flow plot, uh, and then no binding to the other uh, to Sino and the three family members, and which are plotted here. So those are in agreement. And then here is just a uh, a truncated version of the the human uh, antigen. So we have high affinity, and then uh, no binding. Unfortunately, it wasn't cross reacted to Sino. We found that that was a uh, bigger challenge than we thought, and uh, we were able to you know still advance the program without as many Sino cross reactive clones as we'd like. So the hybridoma discovery screening funnel up until this point uh, resulted in a, a lot of um, really interesting, well-characterized and well-behaved antibodies in our hands. Uh, from 306, we whittled it down to 47 binding the recombinant protein, uh, the recombinant human, and then 10 binding the Sino. And then we found 26 binding the isogenic cell express TA1, uh, and then 17 through this cancer cell line, and then uh, 11 out of the group uh, show no cross reactivity to the uh, to the family members, both by SPR and by fax. And so this was us kind of summarizing uh, the clones we thought were interesting from the hybridoma supernatant stage. And so uh, for the most part, they're a single digit animal affinity. A few of them are double digit. This one's a, a bit weaker, and, and I believe this was selected because it had a, a really unique epitope. And so we'll, we'll we'll take a number of those just to have a better understanding of how the epitope, uh, what role it plays in the killing. And so this was from the Balb C mouse. And then what was interesting, the, uh, these, these transgenic mice had a really, really high affinity. So we were in almost like 100, 200 picomolar range affinity for human TA1, uh, whereas some of them didn't show any binding, but I, I believe showed some binding to cells and um, and had a unique, a unique epitope. And so, you know, the recombinant protein is not always exactly representative of the cell expressed, but uh, for the majority of this campaign, we saw uh, a good agreement across it. So we'll select those subclones, excuse me, we'll select those club clones to be subcloned. We'll recheck their activity um, to make sure we didn't lose anything in the subcloning process. We'll gather the sequences and then we will um, we will plug it into our, our kind of bi-specific platform. And we'll do, we'll check cell killing. But uh, we can also very nicely check the uh, cross spinning because these aren't from soups anymore, so we can directly mobilize them. And uh, what we found on the preliminary binning experiment was that there was, um, you know, there's four tool maps and the majority of them didn't bind to any of them. And so we selected the ones that showed unique uh, profiles with different um, sandwiching antibodies, but the majority of them didn't show binding to any, all four. And so it looks like uh, we have some epitope diversity here, but it was uh, somewhat biased to one region as, you know, there's these communities here, but there's a clear overlap between them. And so we have epitope diversity, but it, it just looks like it was biased towards, uh, you know, one, possibly one domain on, on that antigen. And then we can take that uh, cross binning data and compare it to our, our cell killing data and so we'll incubate uh, NK cells with the uh, cancer cells and our, our bispecific, and we'll check to see how well those bispecifics can uh, you know, bind the uh, cancer cell line and can signal to the NK cell uh, to kill it. And in this specific one, we found you know, the, the majority of them were already biased to this domain, so it was difficult to tease out whether the domain had a big role, um, but we found that Overall, the affinity uh, had a, a significant role in its both its EC50 and its its uh, specific lysis. So uh, AB073, this this highest uh, uh, percent specific lysis and lowest EC50 had a uh, had an affinity of about nine nanomolar. And similarly, these other two AB150 uh, and and 52 
at affinities on the same order of nine nanomolar. And then these ones uh, drop off pretty quickly, and, and that's when we're getting to the 20 and, and 25 nanomolar uh, affinity range. And so this helps us better understand the profile we're looking for in these antibodies and, and whether we need to go back and, and affinity mature or, or potentially look at a, a different domain. But in this instance, it looks like the, the um, response was a bit biased to, to what it reacted against in the mice. And so overall, the LSA has allowed us to just do much more rigorous screening much earlier on. So pre-LSA, we weren't screening uh, cross-reactivity against recombinant proteins. Uh, if we had a prohibitively large library, I mean, if we had 10 or 12, you know, we could still get it on in a reasonable time. But once you get dozens to 100, uh, it, it just makes no sense. And so we, we couldn't do it. We would have to defer to the cell binding data. And then um, again, and, and, and work through the pipeline until that number shrunk to something that's more manageable. But now we can get uh, a much more robust package early on. And so we don't advance uh, a pro, uh, uh, an antibody that is potentially cross reactivity, as cross reactivity to um, you know, a family member that we don't want. Uh, conversely, we don't want to triage one out um, based on incomplete characterization. So we uh, get to avoid that problem uh, pretty nicely with this instrument. And so uh, majority of it so far has been um, kinetic screening and uh, some epitope binning and cross binning experiments. Uh, the future applications we're going to look at are the tighter analysis of the of the antibodies because um, we'd like to provide that information to our uh, colleagues in the, doing the cell binding and uh, their their other uh, in vitro assays. Um, we're also going to look at supernate and cross binning. I've had a few conversations with Ira at, at Cartera about the possibility of um, you know very early on in the screening funnel taking those um, crude hybridomas, capturing them to a to the surface, and then cross linking them. Uh, so they're covalently linked to the chip surface and then um, bending them against each other. And then we can have a, a much earlier understanding of um, what kind of diversity we have rather than having to defer just to uh, tool antibodies. With that, I'd like to thank uh, a few folks at Cartera who made this all possible. John McKinley uh, spent a long time, you know, organizing these webinars and going back and forth and making sure they're organized and um, and just assembling really the the whole um, the whole presentation. Similarly, Noah Ditto had a, a large role in uh, facilitating all of this. Uh, Ira back at Cartera is their application scientist has spent uh, tons and tons of time with me going over data analysis uh, and experimental design. And so a lot of the data you saw today was uh, was birthed out of Ira's um, uh, help. And uh, Rick Galley is their senior uh, field service engineer. Who you know, if we ever have an issue with the instrument, he he pops in the next day and and has it uh, run up and running again. So he's been a tremendous help. A dragonfly. Uh, I'd like to thank Shovik Chattopadhyay, who is our um, our cell expression head uh, in our biologist group. He's also the project lead of TA1, and so we spent a long time with me just going through uh, the screen funnel because I didn't at the time didn't have all the information on all the cell binding and cell killing, and so he helped me uh, very nicely assemble some uh, really critical um, pieces of data as well as just going through the the, the full uh, screen funnel. And lastly, Austin Grinberg is our head of biologics at Dragonfly. And she took a lot of time to review the slides and and uh, help kind of, uh, you know, make a more compelling story about uh, how we implemented it and, and some of the important features to point out. So she spent a long time with me uh, just going through uh, what's important, what's not, and uh, help me complete the uh, the slide deck for today. And with that, uh, I think Noah is on the line from Cartara, and he can probably answer some of the more specific questions about um, the ins and outs of the instruments. And I'd be happy to take any questions about uh, how we use it at Dragonfly or, or anything that I can answer uh, Dragonfly related. Thank you, Dan. That was a very informative presentation. We'll, uh, we'll start our panel discussion now with Dan and Noah Ditta, our technical product manager. If you have any questions, please send them to me, John McKinley, the host, by private chat. So we, we have some questions coming in. Dan, do you generally see agreement between recombinant and cell-expressed antigen binding? 
Um, yeah, I mean, we usually do pretty rigorous characterization of the recombinant protein before doing any screening. And so I think that's a, a, a function of um, the biologist teams just doing a deep characterization of them. And so that, that's always an important part of our screening funnels to make sure we have good recombinant protein. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be producing very useful data. So uh, for that fact, yeah, usually we, we have a pretty strong agreement between the uh, cell express and recombinant protein. Another question for you, Dan. Do you use the LSA to assay trinket molecules or all of those qualification tests done with cell-based assays? No, we definitely we definitely use the LSA for that, especially um, if we have a uh, if we, we have to humanize a number of the the clones from the wild type Alt C mice, and so um, we if we have a lot of humanized variants, uh, we may we may go to the LSA to check that you know we didn't we didn't lose binding, or uh, or you know how the affinity and kinetics change of that. Oh, okay. We have a question for, for Noah. How long does it take to complete kinetic screen for 384 clones? Yeah, so uh, it, it depends a little bit on how you're setting up the assay. Um, so there is some upfront um, surface prep considerations. You might be making an anti say, FC capture surface or already have one made. Um, and it kind of depends on how many um, blocks of 96 unique samples you're printing on the surface because it can go from 96 all the way up to 384 um, to use the maximum capacity of the sensor chip in the LSA. Um, but maybe leaving those variables out, the actual um, kinetic analysis itself, which includes warm up cycles of buffer blanks and then a kinetic titration of maybe an eight point member series would be on the order of maybe six hours, um, give or take, depending on your off rates. Um, if you had really long off rates, it might go a little longer. If you're doing a little um, more of a rapid characterization with shorter off rate times, it might be a little less. Another question for you, Noah. How reproducible is ligand capture between cycles and between spots? Uh, it's usually fairly good. I mean, it, it's a, again, kind of a, a a qualified answer I'll give, knowing that there's lots of different systems and ways um, you can run assays. So, so there's there's certain things and variables involved. But uh, if we just look at maybe a, a fairly standard anti-FC sort of capture approach, uh, something like that, we would expect to see probably 10% or less variability typically in, in ligand densities um, across the array. Usually that's uh, that's kind of our benchmark in manufacturing to really get under that 10% to make sure the instruments perform that good. And in the field, we typically see it perform that way as well. Another question, Noah. How, how good is bulk shift referencing for low affinity experiments? Uh, so I'm um, not entirely sure maybe what the concern is uh, with low affinity um, bulk shift, but I'll address bulk shift in general. So um, if we're doing um, maybe crude experiments, uh, there, there could be bulk shift being introduced um, from the, the crude matrices itself. Um, the software does have the ability to, to do double referencing to, to remove any of those artifacts. So it's typically not an issue. Sometimes in binning experiments, we may have the supernate flowing and, and have a fairly large bulk shift, for example. Um, that uh, we just um, adjust the data analysis parameters to avoid uh, the influence of that bulk shift on the data, for example. But it usually, um, I guess the question is maybe if affinity, if you're flowing a, a low concentration material and you might need more material. Uh, we typically run the assay though with, with uh, crude, crude supernatants for kinetics uh, with the, the antibodies on the surface, kind of like Dan was describing here. Um, so generally we, we purify basically on our chip when we array the, the antibodies on the surface. So it tends to mean that we don't have any crude matrices, uh, the antigens typically purified. Um, so there's not usually a bulk shift concern in terms of trying to measure kinetics. Thanks, Noah. Dan, how long does it take for you to set up and run a kinetics experiment and also for a binning experiment? 
So kinetics, um, I mean, we're doing it from hybrid on a soup. So really the most laborious part is just taking soup out of tubes and putting it in the plate. So to get through, like, if you wanted to plate out 96 soups, it might take you know, a little under an hour. And then um, the navigator software is very easy to set up a run. Uh, so actually, you know, putting it on the instrument takes all the five minutes. Same thing with diluting the antigen. So the upfront work is really just setting up the plate and then, um, and then diluting the antigen and, and writing the method takes again, like five minutes. So it'll take about an hour or that for binning, um, that can be more involved depending on what kind of experiment you're doing. So if you are just doing, if you're doing like a large cross binning experiment, like that one I had showed with the purified material, um, that can take a little bit just to, uh, create different, uh, chip densities of each, uh, immobilized antibody, as well as to then go and dilute it in running buffer and, and, and come up with a, a consistent concentration of that. So, you know, that, that can vary a little bit. It could be, it could be, it could be half an hour to take, um, you know, that, that one part took me two hours to set up. Um, but you know, the, there's really no, I think alternative to, to getting that kind of breadth of data. Dan, there's a, a follow-up question about the time it takes to do the analysis for a large kinetics experiment, say over hundred colognes, and then also about doing binning analysis for a large set of clones for the analysis. Yeah, so kinetics is nice um, because the software offers a lot of tools to just screen out dead antibodies or ones beneath, you know, certain Rmax thresholds. And so the more I use it, the more I appreciate those kind of functions. And so if I'm going to go through like 96, I mean, I, I take a look at every sensor gram and just, just to see that, you know, one analyte concentration didn't have some, some bulk shift or something and, or, or you know, the, the soup was polyclonal. Um, but usually we'll have anywhere from 10% to 50% be active. And so for a hundred antibodies, it might take me, uh, maybe an hour to, to go through them. Binning, binning takes longer because there's just a lot more centigrams and, and more, I think, maybe not entirely subjectivity, but um, I think more detailed analysis, you know, cycle by cycle, you've taken different considerations. So that one will take a bit longer depending on, you know, if you, if you want to really get that exact, which I imagine you would, it would, it might take um, a, a two hours or three if you're going to go centigram by like, you know, you know, sandwiching event by sandwiching event. Thanks, Dan. Noah, if you have lower expressing supernatants, what is the minimal concentration required for kinetic analysis? Uh, on, um, <laughs> again, another question, which is somewhat assay dependent and what your sample types are. Um, but we can say that um, in, in like an anti-FC type capture format, um, uh, we really leverage the, the power of the LSA to, to have its bi-directional flow capabilities. So when we take a, a crude matrices in particular, which for the expression levels can be low and variable, um, that, that sample plug is, is flown back and, across, back and forth across the surface um, for really any amount of contact time the user wants to. So we're doing this on-ship um, purification or enrichment. Uh, it really drives drives the assay sensitivity to really, really low levels. Um, so um, data sets we've seen uh, for anti-FC capture, we'd be pretty confident that you can get in the maybe 50 to 75 nanogram per mil range. And, and that's getting enough material, um, say the antibody on the surface that you can make a confident um, kinetic measurement with a typical protein antigen. Uh, so that would be, that would be the, the ballpark, um, 50 to 75 nanograms per mil. No, another question for you. Can I set up multiple analytes to run over the same sample set for assays one after another? Yeah, and it would sort of depend on how you're setting up the array and um, 
what the reactivity profile is of the antibodies in the array. So if you happen to be doing kind of a multiplex experiment, maybe you have two different projects of smaller sets of antibodies and you simply want to run a single experiment, you could you could capture, say, um, antibodies from project A and antibodies from project B onto the same sensor chip. And then in one experiment, flow antigen against project A and antigen, antigen against project B across that surface. You would get two measurements and they would be um, if everything goes well, you should have no cross reactivity in your antibodies. Um, so you can you can generate the data that way. Uh, you, conversely, if you if you directly immobilize the antibodies um, and you have maybe a human in a sino form, you would have the ability to maybe run the human series, regenerate the surface uh, of any human antigen, and then run the sino series, for example. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it. It really just kind of depends on what the antibodies are and what they're reacting against. Um, it dictates the assay setup. We have one more question. Dan, how were you screening hybrid hybridoma supernatants before you had the LSA? Um, mostly, mostly through cell binding. We would we would test them and measure kinetics and affinity after the biology team would, um, you know, let us know which ones were active and and which ones bind the cell express version. But the screening funnel from the SPR end was, uh, I guess, more primitive in that we just essentially didn't really have much for the really large libraries. Again, if we got, if we got them the smaller ones piecemeal, we would still be able to work through it reasonably on the BIA core. But um, as we kind of increase these libraries, um, that was, that was essentially the funnel would be deferred to cell binding and then, um, see what was left. And then we would get those on the vehicle. Well, great. Well, well, thank you so much, Dan, for that very informative presentation. Thank you, Noah, for joining our, our panel discussion. And I would like to thank our audience and everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, if you have any additional questions. Please reach out to Dan and Noah. Their email addresses are up on the screen. And uh, we really appreciate everybody attending. Thank you all so much.